The Anishinaabe called it Mississippi, the Great River. Mark Twain called it the Lawless Stream. The Mississippi defined St. Louis, shaping its life and culture. But for many, the connection has been broken. Architect Derek Hefferlin was born and raised in St. Louis. He has dedicated much of his career to studying rivers. Take the paddle out and see if you can reacquire the rhythm. We are on the Mississippi River in a couple boats, Voyager canoes, and we're out here with um, crew from WashU, Washington University in St. Louis. And the main goal today is to bring people who have never been out here, such as the students, to gain a new perspective of what it means to live in the St. Louis region. My family, my dad and my mother, grew up just north of here on the river in North County and North City. They used to come to the river. There used to be parties out on Mosentine Island. They used to water ski. But then something happened. Whether it was suburbanization, whether that was white flight, I think it became this message that this was not a public place. This was for industry. This was for commercialization. The St. Louis area was colonized by French fur traders. Commerce grew for a century. After the Civil War, railroads competed with river shipping. In 1930, Congress directed the Corps of Engineers to maintain the wandering channel with a vast system of locks and dams. So that's literally why the barges are designed the way they are, is because of this mandate of Congress called the Nine Foot Channel, which sounds totally mundane and boring, but it's one of the most impactful acts of Congress that completely transformed the way that this whole river system is used for a global trade network. So that's been amazing, but it's also come with a lot of um, consequences or even collateral damage. Just north of the city, a rocky shoal makes barge navigation almost impossible. Today, commercial traffic is routed through the Chain of Rocks Canal. It's basically a straight line as a detour to get barge traffic up and down. And doing all that, it's created this stretch of river that doesn't have commercial traffic. You hear things like trains or planes flying over you, but other than that, it's just you, the canoes, and whatever emerging ecologies that are happening out here. Watersheds are huge, yet intricate systems. Decisions made upstream can echo for hundreds of miles. The locks and dams were this marvel of 20th century engineering that really enabled massive commerce, and it did a lot for our economy. But during those times, certain priorities weren't made like the environment, for instance. So as a designer, as an architect, I'm collaborating with other allied disciplines, people like ecologists and economists, we start to speculate. What does it mean to think in the future more transboundary? Whether it's states, whether it's countries, whether it's politics. It's not just studying the Mississippi, but it's also understanding it in the context of other global river basins. For many different reasons, I've decided to also study the Mekong River Basin and the Rhine River Basin. The way that they've been managed over time or transformed is basically almost the same. They all have locks and dams. They all have levees. They all have climate extremes. They all have obviously communities that are very diverse and different across them, but they have all these problems or challenges, but also opportunities. This is an incredibly interesting river system to study because it's not just studying the environment or it's just studying ecology or just studying engineering. We talked a lot about what the Corps of Engineers and what cities and the government has done in the last century, but this goes back several centuries. This is the land of many indigenous nations. There used to be dozens of mounds that were up and down this river that were systematically eradicated. Just to the south of here, you can probably see it, is the Mary Meacham Freedom Crossing. It was the Underground Railroad. So you have that kind of history to reckon with. 
Life on the river has always swung between flooding and drought. Climate change could hasten the cycle. The modeling of the current climate extremes, not just high water level and low water level, but also the frequency of these events, were not part of that original design framework. The next hundred years needs to be far less about gray infrastructure, literally concrete and steel infrastructure, and much more nature-based solutions, where they're able to create more space to let the, the river do what it wants to do naturally. The human impacts that are creating the current wave of climate change are real and they are dire. It's not that we're going to stop it. Um, that's hubris. We're not just like we're never going to stop the Mississippi River. We're always in this mindset, adapt nature to us. That's the wrong way to think about it. We need to adapt ourselves to, to nature. Like once you get people into the canoe, it just, the, the mindset changes. You're floating and then you're looking back at St. Louis or Illinois. And what you kind of often see is like, that's not St. Louis, that's not Illinois, that's not what I've known. There's something different happening out here, you know, and it makes you kind of think differently about it.